Hello everybody and welcome to the latest edition of this Sky F1 vodcast. I'm delighted to say that joining myself, Paul DeResta and Ted Kravitz today, we've got the chairman of the Grand Prix Drivers Association, two-time law winner Alex Verts is here. How are you doing Alex? Uh, how's things going for you? How's lockdown? Uh, are you out now? Because you're just about outside of Monaco and you, uh, how's that? How's that going? Yeah, first, uh, hello. Thanks for having me. Hello everyone on the on this uh, um, video call. Uh, strange times. Uh, I hope uh, everyone at home is doing fine. Uh, in my case, I'm doing fine. I'm on lockdown outside of Monaco and um, my family and we are in, in good shape and good health. I know you're talking a lot with uh, Ross and Formula One about the restart um, in your capacity as chairman of the GPDA. Um, you know, what, what are you guys talking about? It's not a negotiation, I presume. It's just a discussion. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It's not a negotiation. Uh, there's nothing to negotiate. It is just to discuss and debate and use the collective brain power of everyone involved in our sport to ensure that we can come back as early, but also as safe as, as we literally could and can. Is everybody on board? I mean, has there been any pushback from the drivers about, um, you know, getting into this biosphere? Because what are we, five, six weeks away from, from, from starting now? Everyone bought into the, the whole idea of getting into this and everyone being safe once they're in it. Uh, well, we can discuss this for a long time. But look, let me say that I think no one in motorsport, no driver, uh, and personally, me, definitely not, is a fan of ghost races. Um, because we live from the emotions which are shared together. Let it be a football match or athletics. You have a stadium, we have a racetrack with 100,000 of spectators to share this uh, great event uh, together. And that makes a big difference of how you feel. However, all the drivers I have spoken to and no one, and I'm constantly in talks with all of them, uh, no one has said, no, I don't want to do it or I feel it's the wrong thing to do. It is actually the right thing to do because we have an obligation to our industry. Our motorsport, Formula One, is a global industry. And like every government in the world, we are all trying to kickstart the industry, the economy, because people, families, mortgages depend upon it. And it's the same in, in Formula One. So ghost races are a mean to get us back on track earlier than when, if we wait for fan attended races. So therefore, we are looking into ghost races and all the drivers accept fully. So Alex, if the Grand Prix Drivers Association is, is mainly about safety then and the driver's safety, um, what kind of things then are you making sure that, that all the necessary medical facilities would be in place and that you've got enough doctors, which itself might be an issue given that there are doctors needed elsewhere in these countries? That we get to? Yes, absolutely. So first of all, I think... Uh, no sport, definitely not F1. We are not going to nations and we are not going uh, to places where the crisis is still so acute that there is not enough capacity in the medical system. In the medical system within our closed circle, but definitely in the medical system uh, around in the nation or in the region. Uh, that's, that's 100% and uh, the FIA, Jean Dott, as well as Chase Carey and Rossi have made it very clear. Uh, definitely in the case of Austria, I'm Austrian, I know that we have full capacity. Uh, the cases we were lucky as a nation were very uh, little and low numbers. So in terms of medical treatments, medical space, emergency units around uh, the Red Bull ring, there is no problem. Um, then we have to of course ensure that we are not passing the virus on between the industry and the hosting nation. Uh, there are a lot of things which uh, are foreseen. And uh, equally within our circle, we have to ensure that we are distance uh, between each other and we minimize the risk of passing on. Alex, how, how are the Austrian people? You're obviously, it's your native language and I'm sure you follow what happens in the country. Are they fully behind sport restarting and is it important they get a Grand Prix back there? Because it seems that uh, certainly the Red Bull ring and the Matichits and all that, they're very keen to make it happen. Is that the same support all the way through that system? Well, I can't speak for each and every Austrian and um, uh, like every year and in every event around the world, you have someone who is critical. Uh, but in general, Austria is 
extremely proactive of restarting the economy uh, for tourism, for sport, for events, for culture, uh, etc. So no, the Austrian government already spoke about it. The local government as well as the, uh, our um, um, nationwide government said, we are supportive, we have to ensure that it's safe and uh, that's, that's in, in, in full progress. And on this note, I, I would like to mention something which I feel is very important to see that motor racing, I think especially since after uh, Senna Ratzenberger accident in Imola, as even so we are pushing each and every day the driving to the limit, we became an incredibly safe industry. Everyone in the motorsport world, from the mechanics, the team bosses, the officials, is used to very strict safety protocols. And that has worked fantastically over the last three, four decades. Sir Jackie Stewart started the whole idea of, of safety. And the sport, never compromising on performance, has become extremely safe. Well, it's, it's not 100% safe, but we really are on the edge of pushing safety uh, further and further. And it's, it actually, it was beautiful to see that all the involved people from the FIA, um, from F1, uh, also, in this case, drivers and other key stakeholders, really went very systematic through the entire process in order that internally we can ensure we're doing everything we know of uh, to ensure safety um, for the participants, but also for the nation. Alex, whilst we've got you here, uh, uh, you know, some of our viewers might not be aware of the, of the great work that you guys do in the GPDA. Just explain to me you know, what the very essence of it is. And also, Roman let slip that you, know, you guys have got a WhatsApp group. I'm sure everyone would love to see what, what gets written on there. But um, we know that Vettel and, and Grosjean are directors. Who, who are the, the louder voices within the group that help you and, and sort of back you up when something is... Or, or are you sort of the the spokesperson for the entire group. How does it work? Well, yeah, so we have 100% membership. Uh, we are a very exclusive club because only current drivers or test drivers of current seasons are members of the GPDA. Uh, that's 100% membership since uh, two years. Um, and uh, we are here for, we, we call us here for the safety, for our sport, our fans. Um, so we are a safety organization, but in some cases it goes well beyond safety. Uh, you know, uh, I remember, which was well before my times when, uh, God bless him, uh, Nicky Lauda passed away uh, a year ago. Um, he led a driver strike when Bernie Ecclestone wanted to have the full rights on the image of the drivers. He realized, hey, hang on a minute. This is my face, so I want to make money on it. And he went to strike in Kielami. Thank God we didn't have to go for a strike yet. Even so, occasionally a driver brings it up. Um, but uh, we also, here in the, for the general interest um, of Formula One, not only the drivers, because we have a sport at the purest of interests. We love the sport since childhood. We are not commercially, uh, we are not commercial in that sense that we have to please shareholder values. Um, so it's a very pure uh, view of, of the sport, sometimes simple, but I can tell you. If you give a chance to the drivers, and we as a GPD are an organized body to collect the average opinion of the drivers. So we are filtering out what Mercedes wants, what Red Bull wants, and we make it an average opinion. And that is a healthy process. We work mostly behind the scenes. Uh, so it's rare that we speak of what we're doing uh, in, in public, because we also are not here to be controversial. And we can see that the FIA uh, and F1 are now uh, actively speaking and communicating with us over the last few years. And it's a, a good relationship. It's healthy in the process of dreaming from one to be fit for the future. On track, off track. So who, who are the loudest voices then? Uh, as you can hear, it's me. <laughs> no. um, it is interesting, uh, depending on what uh, matter and what subject, uh, some drivers are more um, emotionally involved or not. But uh, I would think, uh, yeah, between the, the superstars, the long-time superstars, let it be uh, Lewis, let it be 
Sebastian as a director. Uh, we have Max, who is very proactive. We have Valtteri, uh, Carlos Sainz. A few people are more quiet, but constantly reply on the emails or WhatsApp. So I think everyone is involved because um, we see that we want to be an important support uh, to, uh, for the sport. It's just like us, Alex. You can never get Simon off it. He's constantly replying to everything. He's <laughs> texting back and uh, yeah, he's always on it. But you mentioned the future. And that's interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, we all, we all sort of have goals. We all think that after this period of introspection or reflection, we can, we can come back better and, and whatever our field is, have it, have it better than it was before. What's the hope from the drivers in terms of um, getting back racing means hopefully that all the teams will still be there, number one. And number two, with the, with, with the revolution in the money distribution, what's the hope for the future of Formula One that you know, people outside the top three might actually get cars and facilities where they can win again? Yeah, that, look, it's very simple. Uh, uh, and I can tell you that 100% all drivers are of this opinion. Even the ones in the most dominant cars say, we want Formula One to be as tight as possible on lap times so that from the first to the last, it's maybe like in, in karting where it's a few tens in between. Because that means the pressure increases. If the pressure is high, you have human failure uh, or a human hero action. And this is the emotion. We want to be under as drivers, and I'm sure uh, Paul is the same. Uh, but also the fans want to see. They want to see the hero in zero, and that only comes in, in very critical moments when the pressure is really high. So a condensed field in lap time would be fantastic. Um, we are not the commercial right holders, but we are commercially aware that F1 has to be a business, and we believe with a uh, uh, budget cap or resource restriction in whatever shape or form Formula One will be more sustainable for the future, will create value for the teams and therefore you will always find uh, someone who will invest in the team as a partner, as a sponsor or as just a private investor. So the direction which is going uh, seems to be okay. Of course, you can't change such a long-term business model and we're still living in the afterworld of uh, Bernie Eccleston era. Uh, we are now connecting to uh, uh, Liberty and we have to make the sport fit for any anyway, fast changing consumer behavior and you from the media you know that more than anyone and also change in uh, statues of the car of the automobile itself because uh, it's not anymore the, the luxury sign and sign of, of freedom it becomes more a, a object to use to go to work and even that is, is somehow changing. So there's a lot of changes F1 has to go under and we think it has to happen steadily, carefully and really well thought through because uh, no one in this sport can afford a mistake and wrong decisions. And this is again where the drivers also want to and are participating in this process. Alex, obviously uh, there's a lot of change in Formula 1 at the moment, but when you look at uh, the new rules which are going to be slowed down because of where we are in the world at the moment, that's going to be introduced over the next two or three years. Uh, there was a big change in the driver matter. It absolutely exploded uh, last week when the new Sebastian Vettel moved in. How did you see that follow on? Did you see that coming? You're very close to him. Uh, could you have predicted it? Sebastian is a, is a friend of mine. Uh, I didn't see it coming. He keeps... The, those cards are uh, always very close to his chest. Just remember back the move he did from Red Bull to Ferrari. Um, there was no rumors, uh, nothing. It just happened. And that's typical for Sebastian. And I really like his style on, on this. Um, personally, if you look at the history from Ferrari, you have always this first few years and months of uh, big love and uh, all these radio calls and, you know, all the emotions which come out of Italy, which makes Ferrari and Italy is so beautiful. Um, but at one point, even Fernando also, you ha it seems like the whole system makes you go into a burnout where, yeah, maybe uh, the love is not there anymore and that seems to happen. Sebastian hasn't spoken to, to me about that, so question. But you are 100% right. Uh, send a shockwave through uh, the driver market and we're still not sure how it will unfold fully. Okay, well, well let's pick up on that and, and see if we can, because, you know, I, I suppose in terms of moving this story on, Ted, 
Um, you know, there have been now uh, a few reports that Valtteri might be looking around and to the vacant seat at Renault. Can you understand potentially his, his reasons for doing so? And, um, you know, what do you make of them? What do you make of these reports? I can understand Valtteri's reasons for looking around. He's only ever been on one year contracts. He has to sort of protect his future. And um, he knows how close Sebastian is with Toto Wolff. Um, I still think Valtteri would trust Mercedes that they'd look at him first. And if not, then they'd probably look at Esteban Ocon and maybe even size up George Russell as well, promoting him to the big team. But Valtteri has to protect his options and look around. And Renault would be one of those things. Um, but I was interested, Simon, what um, at, at Alex's point about stars who go to Ferrari and then burn out, you know, like Fernando Alonso couldn't make it work. Although Alonso is a very uh, different character to Seb. He almost came close to winning a couple of championships. But what is it there? Do you think it's that, Alex, it's, it's Ferrari's passion uh, that can be the great thing about them, but also hurt them in some ways that the British teams maybe are a bit more, I don't know, passionless, dispassionate. There you go, that's the word. And, and that might help them in F1. I think uh, I'm married to uh, English. Uh, uh, my wife. We are married since uh, 18 years. So there is passion. Uh, I know that <laughs> in English, and the English racing teams as well. Uh, just very different to uh, Ferrari. And Ferrari has uh, the full national pride on their shoulders. It is an amazing brand. Um, and there is more to it uh, than just that racing passion. There is really the national uh, pressure up on you. And the drivers go through that. Uh, Ferrari is very demanding of the drivers. They really love if you're critical. Uh, with them and you push them forward but if the success is not coming then suddenly that starts to backfire and they will also be protective about their heritage about their work and about their quality and then at this point I can observe that there's always friction coming in and that's not only for drivers they have changed uh, team principles also over the years um, and um, I think that comes with outside influence, but also the Latin lifestyle. So that mixture it seems to be tricky. And we, if we look back in the Schumacher, uh, Ross Brown, Rory Brown, uh, Jean Dot era, is I think that group went in there and was so strong together that they could succeed and push it to the side, this Italian pressure, let's call it like this. But ever since, they have uh, separated. Ferrari is behind its own expectation. Yeah, and I think that's probably one of the key reasons, isn't it? Why, you know, on your, on your point about why the big stars burn out there, it's maybe because they're, they're so close to getting a car that can win and they, they seem to always constantly fall short, don't they? Whereas Mercedes, Paul, if you look at what's going on there and the success that they've achieved, I'm, I'm interested to see, because Dr. Marco made some comments, didn't they, about bringing young talent through in Mercedes and how they've never actually done it up to this point point they've not they've not brought someone through the whole process and into one of their seats usually they look externally um for, for their talent um what, what, what do you suggest is the next step if Bottas was to move and I, I'm not saying he will or he won't but if he was to move do you think that Ocon's next in line or do you think that um or do you think that George Russell might be the favorite for that 2021 seat or 2022 whenever it may pan out I think Ocon's probably fine for that because he's gone to Renault so I think Renault will up for years, they've got the option on him, although he's still managed by Toto, I'm sure some kind of deal could be done in this world. But one of the things that has been key, I think, to certainly the success of Mercedes and where they are, even since the Honda Braun days, they're very good at keeping people in the same positions and their expertise and rewarding them for that, giving them bigger positions, let them grow with the company. If you look at the engineering team that we still see sitting in the garage, it's very unchanged. And like last year, when Lewis's engineer didn't uh, attend the race, you know, there was somebody standing there to take the line. Lewis actually went on to win the Grand Prix with that person as well. Um, and I think that's the whole, you know, the whole way they go about it. And I guess if you're standing there as Toto Wolf, yes, you could bring George Russell in. Would you want two Brits representing the mighty German brand that they are, which I don't think would worry them. But what could happen is internal politics like they had for Rosberg and Hamilton. Uh, because, you know, if, if you're a young guy, you want to go in there and prove your point. Whereas it's very much like the Schumacher, Barrichello, Hamilton, Bottas relationship at the moment. On a good day, Bottas can beat Lewis. 
Uh, he can push him to the extent he needs to be pushed, but he's always just going to fall short at the moment of winning a world championship while Lewis is on the form he is. Uh, because Lewis can drag these results out of it. Even if he qualifies P6, you can never disregard him to go on and win the race because somehow he will outclass people through the Grand Prix. You know, it's almost like he's thinking ahead of what the team and the strategy you guys are thinking. So uh, at the moment, while it's working and while you're still winning a manufacturer championship, I don't see why you would change it. I think you would probably save yourself some money by Bottas' salary as well in this day and age. Simon, it's a good point, and Alex, it's a good point Paul makes, you know, why upset the apple cart? And Sebastian against Lewis would be interesting. It's interesting that Sebastian seems to be happy to go up against Lewis in Mercedes. But Alex, go on, I'll ask you then, what do you think Seb's going to do next? And what, do you think Alonso is going to come back? Hey, I have a question first. Uh, maybe I missed something. So you guys are all 100% certain that Lewis will stay at Mercedes? Or... <laughs> Years to come. Uh, uh, tell me, tell me. 99, 99%, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's staying. Why would you not think? Well, what are you going to tell us is different? Come on. Maybe he's been texting you. <laughs> no, it's a fair question. In the end, uh, you are all asking about the second seat at Mercedes, whilst the f let's call it the first seat, the other seat, to be politically correct, uh, isn't fixed. You have the team principal himself, who is uh, there debates if he will stay in what function he will stay so it's a lot floating but Paul mentioned that this team is very specific and I think it's it's the underlying reason for success that they have the people in place for a long time and they start to know the strengths and weaknesses of each other and cover each other beautiful and the results speak for it um, so my gut feeling if I had to bet and I'm Austrian I usually don't bet I prefer to keep the money <laughs> Um, I think they would keep it, keep the current lineup as it is. It seems to be very productive. If you would remove Lewis over the last few years, Valtteri would have won the championship. Um, and I think the two work very well together. Um, the rest, I think, is a lot of media debate like we do now. And let's wait how this unfolds. I just want to pick up, Ted, with the last story I want to talk, talk, touch on is Renault. Um, the bailout by the French government and, and what it means for the team long term. We had Cyril on, what, uh, a week or so ago, uh, and everything kicked off. I just wonder, at 200 million euros uh, per year to keep, to keep the uh, Formula One team going, is that going to be high on the list of priorities for them? Where do you see Renault's future? Well, I see Cyril Abipol from that nice house in Burgundy preparing a very important uh, PowerPoint presentation to the, uh, to the, to the board of Renault. Um, putting out the reasons why both the race team in Enstone and the engine department in Viry Chatillon should continue. Because last night, the French finance minister um, said that he is ready with a 5 billion euro bailout for Renault, but he hasn't signed the check yet. Uh, everyone expects them to do that. But um, it looks like the French government is going to take on uh, more ownership of Renault in return for that bailout. But they want to see money back. They want to see that Renault is investing in green technologies. Does that include Formula One? Uh, and they want to see them, you know, protecting French jobs. Does that mean jobs in other countries like Enstone? Well, maybe it doesn't. So Cyril people needs to show them that it's worth the money and worth Renault's uh, position and reputation continuing uh, in Formula One. But yeah, it's quite a, quite a big ask. Uh, from to do that but I mean if if Renault don't decide to go on I think it's the team won't go under guys I think it's very likely that someone would buy the team because it's such a good outfit and um, uh, now there are probably are buyers out there who would buy a Formula One team. Yeah I mean they're looking to find two billions in savings uh, closing four, four factories three models like popular models are seen at the this fast and again by all accounts um, you know, may, you know, maybe may off the production line for the foreseeable future. But Paul, yeah, well, just to yeah, finish up on that, what, how do you counter that? What would you say about uh, Renault's future yourself? Are you hearing anything? I mean, but what I did hear the other day was Fernando Alonso was very close to signing, so that gives you the intention. Uh, there's stability there. Um, listen, I, I can see it both ways. I can see the board saying it's an easy way to save money, but at the same point, it's a great marketing tool. You know, and if Formula One comes back and it's successful. You know, if you, you know, you look at the interview that uh, Total Wolf did with us recently, the marketing value for Mercedes-Benz over the last seven years since they've got successful is absolutely crazy what they can put out there. And the technology, you know, with the way Formula One engines are going, yes, there's still a combustion engine with a hybrid element, but it's going to go more hybrid in the future. So 
it, you know, you've got to represent yourself some way in motorsport because that is leading the way for research and development. And I think only that will say, but, you know, the world is a very strange place at the moment, a very strange place. And I hope for Formula One because they're an, an engine manufacturer, they stay in uh, more, more importantly. Okay, right. I'll come straight back to you, Paul, on your Monaco Grand Prix dream team. We would be there. Uh, it is Friday, so we'd be having a, a lovely day off, wouldn't we, in, in Monaco right now. Uh, you wouldn't be. You'd, be. you'd be looking after your kids. But we'd be having a lovely day off in Monaco. What is your dream team? Come on, then. What, who have you selected? If you can have any driver in any car with any team principal from past, present, or whatever, you can, you can tell us now. Can I just say the weather changed perfectly for the Monaco Grand Prix? I'm sure you wouldn't have got much sleep last night in the port. It is uh, mighty, mighty warm, um, and everybody's up for it. Um, so, dream team wise, I think I'm going to say Jim Clark alongside Ayrton Senna with right. Enzo Ferrari and the Ferrari team as the team leader and team principal. I just love the images of the, the, you know these old guys uh, back in the day on the pit wall, whether it's waving a hat, waving a spanner. There was passion, emotion, um, and it's just people that I would have loved to have saw in person myself what they could have done. And yes, there's probably other people, you know, that have got a better history around Monaco and what they are, but I just think, you know, you've got to regard Jim Clark as one of the greats, if not the great of it. And Ayrton Senna was obviously a master down here. There you go. Nice. I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure too many are going to argue with Jim Clark and Ayrton Senna. <laughs> Uh, Ted, because I'm giving, I'm giving virtually some time here. I can yeah. see he's uh, studiously writing his down. So, go on. I was tempted to go with Ayrton Senna and Graham Hill, you know, both Mr. Monaco's. We can have two Mr. Monaco's. But, um, you know, they've had their success. And I was still thinking that someone who deserved success there, who'd never got it, was Nigel Mansell. Um, he was on course to win in 1992 and then never did. Uh, so I think he deserves to have another shot at it in some sort of dream scenario. And uh, as for the car, I'll go with um, Senna's uh, MP48. That always looked very nimble around Monaco at that slimline nose section. It always looked really quick, even when it was standing still. Uh, and the team, I'd go for Alex's old team, Williams, for the same reason. They never really got the success Williams deserved around Monaco. Well, there you go. Lovely. Uh, have you written it down yet? Alex, who are you going with? Well, I think it's really unfair of you guys to make such a sneak attack to <laughs> speak about it before. Don't warn me. Put me on the spot. <laughs> and then even throughout the conversation, I realize you mean the entire lifespan of former one to name some drivers. <laughs> anyway, I, I think I got my act together. Same me okay. I'm definitely sure about one driver I would have in my team, which is Jochen Rindt, the only post home world champion. Uh, we have in Formula 1, he was a sensational driver, very fast. Bernie Ecclestone loved him. I would keep Bernie definitely as the team owner because uh, incredible business brain. Um, Colin Chapman probably also as the technical director. I'll, but I would move from the dangerous times back then uh, with my favorite car, the McLaren 17D. Um, sensational car, super fast. Kimi won a lot of races in it. Um, maybe the most balanced car I've ever driven. And uh, in Monaco, that, uh, that car would be a dream to race with Jochen Rindt. And the second driver, so many names. Uh, but as a childhood, I loved Chil Villeneuve. Uh, I loved reading about him. I loved hearing about him. Uh, it's either Chil Villeneuve or um, Stefan Belov, who, in my opinion, in this famous Monaco race, when Senna chased Bros down for victory, Stefan Belov was the fastest, and unfortunately, he died in an accident as well. So, um, I, I think he, him and Jochen Rindt um, would have been my team. Okay. And, okay. In, in what car? In the McLaren 17 Okay, there you go. But fair enough. I was going to go with um, Karun and Johnny in his HRT. Well, sorry, in Karun's HRT with Otmar Safnar as the team boss. But I, I think I'll probably go with the Hills. Uh, father and son combo. One had great success in Monaco, the other didn't. In, in his 96 Williams and uh, Sir Frank as, as, as the team boss for what it's worth. Um, can I just ask you before you go as well, obviously on Wednesday it would have been a year on since Nicky Lauda died. Uh, and picking moments, I, I always remember Nicky from just from wandering around the paddock and, and just you know, chatting to the guy because you could he talk to anyone, wouldn't he, Alex? I know you spent a lot of time with him um, you know, in, in many different 
guises and, and capacities. He would talk to anyone. He was so down to earth. He was never affected at all by his superstardom, was he? Yeah, he was an absolute legend. Uh, and uh, in, in terms like we talk, he was a cool dude. Uh, there's nothing else to say. I remember particularly one conversation. We just bumped into each other. We sat down in the Formula One motorhome. And we chatted for two hours. And we done the most um, inappropriate jokes and conversations. And we just couldn't breathe anymore with laughter. Um, because we both talk the same Viennese uh, language, style, slang, whatever you want to call it. And it was just a sensational moment. And uh, I, I miss him. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, great, great guy. Um, PDR, your memories of Nicky? I mean, you've got to say probably the most memorable moment you'll ever see with Nicky was when, you know, his first race back after his accident, you know, the Italian Grand Prix, um, to get back in the car six weeks later and achieve what he did. But the moments always hit me with Nicky. I mean, as much as what Alex said, his friendship around the paddock, there wasn't a more liked character and somebody that stood out. But what always hit me, he never did it very often, and you never saw him without his red cap. The moments when he took his cap off and kind of bowed when one of his guys did an epic race, I think that kind of, it took me in to say, for someone of that stature to say, and the team boss, which don't show emotion, to say that was an incredible moment. To give that away for him, I thought was quite special. So you only saw it maybe once or twice a year, if you did. Um, but the guy was just an inspiration around it. And, you know, I, I'm glad that you can honestly say, you know, I, I got the moments to sit and have lunch with him and see him around the paddock um, because he's, he's sorely missed. And at the same point, it's amazing still that we're still talking about him, even a year on. And I think we will continue to do that each year because it's going to come. It's such a historic moment in the year. And I hope it's remembered for it, as long as I'm involved in Formula 1. Funny, isn't it, Paul? Because he prided himself on being sort of a tough, you know, sometimes gruff individual and didn't like to give praise very easily. But that was the praise he gave, wasn't it? That was the praise to say, well done, I think you've done an amazing job there. But, you know, every, Simon, for me, you know, I'm into my planes, boring plane bore and everything like that. But Nicky was into his planes as well. And let's not forget, as well as amazing driver, he was an incredible businessman. He started three airlines and sold all of them to different <laughs> people uh, using various different names. So he started Louder Air, flogged that off to Lufthansa. He then thought, oh, well, I've got another name, Nicky, Fly Nicky. He then flogged that off to somebody else. And then his last airline was Louder Motion which um, uh, he sold that to Ryanair, you know, so he's, he's run out of names for, uh, for aircraft. But Alex, I'm interested, what is it about the Austrian persona, or maybe it was just Nicky, that he didn't seem to care about consequences? He could say whatever he wanted and have, what was it the bravery of saying whatever he wanted, whatever he thought, and didn't care about whatever trouble it would get him into? Yeah, I mean, uh, not that I know because I wasn't alive then, but we know that uh, he was like this from the beginning on. Uh, and after his accident, he just realized uh, he just wants to be himself and say what he thinks. And he became famous for this. And he's a national hero in Austria. Um, he's done a lot for our nation, not in terms of sport, but in general, representing Austria. Uh, and we are a little bit direct as a nation and say what we think. But Nicky just topped it up, even on that note. Alex, you've got plenty of strings uh, to your bow. So before we go, I just want to ask you, obviously you're invo involved in the design and build at, uh, in Saudi and, uh, and that track over there. How's that going? Uh, well, uh, yes, I am uh, doing the design for the Saudi track in Kidia uh, that was published. Uh, otherwise, I'm not really allowed to speak about it, but it's really exciting. I uh, can't wait that the track will be presented. Uh, I think it is ultra special and will enter the next level of track design. You would say that you're designing it, but I'm sure it will be. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bertie. We hope it's a very exciting one. We, we really appreciate uh, you taking your time out to join us today. Thanks to Paul. Thanks to Ted as well. We've got lots of special Monaco content coming up uh, this weekend. We'll also be live with the F1 show from two o'clock on Sky Sports main event and Sky Sports News and the Sky Sports F1 channel on Monday. So we will see you then. Have a great weekend. Thanks for your company. Goodbye.